Bill uh, was a member of the Clavius group, in addition to being on the permanent staff of the Vatican Observatory, and uh, he was with us a number of times. When I finish what I'm saying, we'll put back the slideshow so that you can see him uh, with the Clavius group uh, in different years, in the 80s and 90s and the beginning of this millennium. So he was born in Torrance, California in 1943, and he entered the Jesuit novitiate at Los Gatos in California in 1961. Then he did a doctorate in astrophysics at Cambridge University under the direction of George Ellis. George Ellis is known for uh, as a, a significant astronomer, and uh, he wrote The Large-Scale Structure of Space-Time with uh, Stephen Hawking, famous book. Uh, and then uh, uh, he became a, a uh, an astronomer at the Vatican Observatory. Uh, his connection with Clavius, in addition to participating here, is that he arranged for Father Andrew Whitman to become uh, an associate at the Vatican Observatory for several years. They worked together on the, the so-called Rosen bimetric theory of gravitation. It's an alternative to Einstein's general relativity. Uh, uh, and they worked together on that, Andy being an expert in differential geometry, which was the important question. So he joined the Clavis group, participated in our annual meetings in 1986 in Berkeley, 1988 at Fairfield, 1992 at the Institut des Hautes Etudes Scientifiques near Paris in Vieux Yvette, and then in 1994 and 2001 at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. So he was with us repeatedly. I'm not sure that there weren't any other times that he was with us. And I remember especially one of Bill's lectures to us. Uh, he was talking about the so-called standard model uh, of uh, particle physics and of cosmology the Big Bang and all of that's involved in. And there was a problem because this uh, background micro microwave radiation, which had been discovered in 1964 by uh, Penzias and Wilson, who were, were trying to make a big radio telescope, and they couldn't get rid of some background noise. In fact, they even looked at the, uh, at the uh, uh, parabolic uh, 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 antenna, and uh, there were some some things that uh, pigeons had left on it, and they cleaned them off, thinking that might have been the reason. But it turned out that what they had, what this noise was, was exactly the, uh, the background radiation from the Big Bang. Uh, and and uh, Bill told us that according to the model, there had to be an anisotropy. Oh, that, that means that in one direction, uh, the strength of this background radiation would be different from another direction. It had to <coughs> depend on the direction. And at that point, they'd gotten down to something like uh, one part in 10,000 and hadn't yet found any anisotropy. And Bill said to us, well, with the improvement of our equipment, we should get down another order of magnitude. And if we don't find uh, the anisotropy, then we're going to have to revise our standard model. But then later on, the Wils Wilkinson probe uh, was put into space and uh, measured the anisotropy and discovered that it, it did come exactly at the critical moment. So that was very fascinating to hear his lecture and then find out that it had been discovered, the, the necessary anisotropy. So I think it's very appropriate that this symposium on faith and science be dedicated to him since he was one of the two key persons, the other one being Robert John Russell in the, uh, well, George Coyne too, but uh, uh, on this uh, setting up uh, symposia, a sequence of uh, seven different symposia sponsored by the Vatican Observatory and uh, Russell's Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences in Berkeley. They had a, a series of se seven different uh, conferences. The first one was in 1987 with Physics, Philosophy, and Theology. It was published and a very interesting one. And then after five uh, conferences on specific topics, there was a kind of a, a general one again 
scientific perspectives on divine action in 2009. And uh, Bill was one of the most articulate and balanced and uh, I think perceptive people involved in this dialogue of faith and science. So his absence is a great loss for the future of this dialogue. I should also mention Bill's pastoral action as a Catholic priest. He was very involved in giving retreats, spiritual retreats and the spiritual exercises, and uh, in other ways serving as a priest. And this fact that he was both an excellent scientist and a believing and practicing Christian made it possible for him to uh, engage in very serious faith science dialogue. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say about Bill, and if I put up here, I said too much, so now I'll pass the word to Chris Corbelly. Cameron, thank you. Um, again, these are fairly brief, but um, in the front here is the obit that the California Jesuit province, so Bill Steger's own province, produced, so you're welcome to pick one up if you haven't already seen that. And um, uh, this is not, Pache, um, Javier, this is not a lecture, this is just some remarks and actually they're stolen. Um, not really, he wouldn't mind. Peter Hess uh, got to know um, Bill, particularly uh, being in California and uh, associated with the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences and Peter until recently was involved with the National Center for Science Education um, on the you know, science and, and religion side of it. So it's that perspective that, that, that Peter uh, Hess writes. And I'll interject a few sort of remarks which will be um, overlap th those that we've already heard from Paul I inevitably. Meanwhile, please do prepare your own reminiscences and remarks on Bill, because that, that's what this is, ain't a lecture. It's just to prompt your own uh, reactions. So, uh, Peter Hess writes, biblical fundamentalists and their opponents on the extreme opposite end of the spectrum of belief often share one significant assumption. In order to contribute to modern science, you have to be an atheist. That is, you cannot at the same time believe in a personal God and accept the scientific explanations of Big Bang cosmology, of the age of our solar system, and of the evolution of biodiversity on Earth. John? <laughs> okay. We'll hear about that this afternoon. So, the so-called intelligent design creationism sidesteps the last question by waffling both on what counts as science and on whether the presumed intelligent designer is in fact God. Um, yeah, I think Peter accurately says that in intelligent design is a cop-out. Um, Pauci, a certain Archbishop of Vienna. Actually, Cardinal, um, who seems to have altered his views. Uh, so the late Jesuit astronomer and cosmologist uh, William R. Steger, S.J., vigorously rejected the false conclusion that to accept modern science you must be an atheist. Ordained, uh, we've had details of, of when he was ordained a priest in 72. He earned his Ph.D. in astrophysics at Cambridge University in 1976 where he was a student of uh, Sir Martin Rees. I'm not sure that George Ellis, I think George Ellis was a contemporary then with him, oh, along I'm with sorry. Stephen Hawkins, but his uh, you know, thesis director was Sir Martin Rees. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, it, it, it's good. It, they're all the you know, Cambridge gang <laughs> at, at that time. Um, and uh, from 1979, so basically, uh, um, shortly after he finished in Cambridge to the end of his life he was a staff scientist with the Vatican Observatory um, and specializing in theoretical cosmology as we know high energy astrophysics and the interdisciplinary studies related to science philosophy and theology. Father Steger's work fell into two general areas physics and theology. 
His scientific research dealt with problems connected with the physics of accretion onto black holes. And that's the, his kind of thesis work in Cambridge, theories of gravity and general relativity. So that's the area of his thesis. Later in life, he concentrated on building stronger bridges between cosmological theory and astronomical observations. Um, and he also pursued research on the physics of quasars and of the central engine in galactic nuclei. So on the way over, I was talking about these uh, um, black holes, that, uh, massive black holes found in the center of galaxies now. So that's uh, his work. But th the neat thing, of course, was the interrelation between cosmology theory and the observations. As I've remarked to people here, um, Theoreticians are wonderful, and we can't do without them, but they are wonderfully inventive, too, and can create incredible universes which may or not, may not be real. Uh, Bill and his colleagues, like George Ellis, uh, wanted to find the observational consequences of the cosmological theory that they were developing, so that the cosmology could indeed be tested. And that's a real tough thing to do. Um, but it has to be done. Otherwise you get multiverses and all kinds of stuff which may or may not exist. Um, so, yes, we, we've had his paper Proving Almost Homogeneity of the Universe, which was co-written with George Ellis and R. Martins, and was referred to by at least 85 other papers in the field of cosmology. And that reference, uh, Brother Guy Consolmanio has been looking into both the publication record uh, of our staff and, you know, citations as well. So, and w what Guy is, uh, said is that um, Bill, during his um, life, you know, his academic life, produced about uh, two papers a year, you know, two very significant papers in cosmology a year uh, with him and obviously his... Uh, colleagues as well, a, a good record, because on the other side there's Steger's theological work, and that focused mainly on interpreting the significance of contemporary cosmology for theology. One of his most seminal essays was The Imminent Directionality of the Evolutionary Process and Its Relationship to Teleology, and I think we heard from Kuru yesterday a, a bit about that, we had a, a quote. Um, from that. So this was in Evolutionary and Molecular Biology, Scientific Perspectives on Divine Action. The book produced as part of the um, Center for Theology in the Natural Sciences and the Vatican Observatory series on God's action in the world that started something like uh, around back in 86 with uh, a meeting at the Vatican Observatory. These meetings were prompted by um, Pope John Paul II um, asking the director George Coyne to celebrate the 300th anniversary of Newton's Principia in some appropriate way and being George he, approached, he suggested two meetings on science and theology the first in Poland of course and the second at Castel Gandolfo and it's these that so then led into the series with a uh, Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, or I should say CTNS, uh, in future on that one. So that's kind of the origin of the, those meetings. And in this um, essay on the imminent directionality of the evolutionary process, uh, Steger carefully examined the question of whether or not there is imminent directionality in nature. He argued that there is a directionality that can be discovered through the natural sciences when we study the emergence of physical and biological structures, complexity, and mind. So it's this emergence <laughs> idea he was going for. However, in sharp contrast to the theory of so-called intelligent design, Steger believed that the discoveries of science speak for themselves. They do not require us to postulate theological mechanisms such as irreducible complexity that are unobservable to science. He argued that the scientific method rules out the necessity and even the possibility of divine intervention 
to complement the principles and processes accessible to science. The Steger, the laws of nature as they function in the universe, are one of the key ways in which God might act in the universe, so through the laws of nature, but not in such a way that we could discover it through scientific research. So I think Peter Hess has well expressed that. Again, Peter um, speaking. Although I did not know Bill Steger very well on a personal level, I did enjoy numerous cordial encounters with him at conferences and workshops. I was impressed with his willingness to engage students in discussion and how he graciously served on the dissertation committee of a doctoral student I referred to him late in his career. I'm sure you, at, at the various uh, Clavius meetings you can agree with that cordial encounters with, with Bill. Steger's fellow Jesuit and Vatican Observatory colleague, Brother Guy Consolmagno, aptly characterizes his versatility. Um, and this is Guy writing. He's the only person I know who could both understand and work with the mathematics of the Big Bang and also direct retreats for religious women. <laughs> Paul has referred to that. And certainly, um, Bill, uh, you know, uh, came to s uh, stay with us uh, in back in Tucson. So, um, I suppose a year ago, last May, uh, when he was, um, you know, diagnosed with the aggressive uh, cancer, uh, he went to the Jesuit Health Center of the California province in Los Gatos, in the sort of lower bay area. To, to get excellent health treatment there. He came back to us a couple of times in Tucson. One was for his 70th birthday at the beginning of, of October, last October. So that was a lovely visit uh, and celebration there. And then came back to us uh, for a week or so before Christmas with the intent of after Christmas um, continuing to stay in Tucson. It didn't work out, as you know. Um, but as he was going back uh, and facing an operation on his spine to remove tumors, uh, then uh, he gave me a whole list of phone numbers of people. And these were people in the US. Th these basically were people I think that he'd met in retreats. Uh, a lot were that he'd given retreats to and stayed in contact since you know, early days, since 70s, 80s, 90s, and through. Um, the kind of key people who could then contact other people. So I had uh, obviously um, uh, numbers in uh, uh, lots in, in Ohio, so around this sort of area, um, uh, and in Ireland and South Africa, and then Brazil, particularly two um, uh, colleagues in cosmology that he uh, was working with currently in Brazil. So dear Bill was awfully well connected. Um, as we found uh, at the memorial that we had for Bill in Tucson uh, in April, just after Easter, um, we wondered quite when to hold it, and then <coughs> after Easter seemed to be ideal to you know, commemorate Bill and the resurrection uh, in the same breath, as it were. And uh, the uh, our memorial mass was hosted by the Benedictine Sisters of per Perpetual Adoration in Tucson, um, uh, with whom Bill had had a lot of lot of dealings and uh, was directing various m members of the community. I used to go regularly with Bill for their penance services in in uh, Lent and in Advent. Uh, so uh, B Bill very well known. So when I left a message uh, on the convent prioress's phone saying please call me, she had already thought of various, she knew what it was about. <laughs> we wanted to have the memorial there and, said, and, and had various dates I in mind that are possibilities. So uh, it, it was a wonderful memorial, a filled church and a reception afterwards. Uh, and his brother, Jack, uh, who's a priest in the uh, um, Archdiocese of LA came, uh, spoke wonderfully as he had, as Jack had also at the funeral um, in Los Gatos. And uh, yeah, it was a, g a great memorial. But again, the, you know, the filled church was a sign of all kinds of things. They were enormously well represented from the university, um, 
the Dean of Science was there, the, uh, and people from the astronomy department, as well as people from all over. Uh, a retired person had traveled by train from El Paso to be present and spent a few days because of the train schedule. He had to spend a few days in Tucson before he could go back again, and, and that was wonderful. Um, so, anyway, a little aside there. One of the people who knew Steger best is Robert Russell, founder and director of the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences. Um, it, in Berkeley, an organization Steger served in varying capacities as board member, advisor, distinguished lecturer, and he was chairman of the board, too, uh, for a time. Russell says that as both a Roman Catholic priest and a distinguished scientist specializing in theoretical cosmology, Bill was committed to the view that God is the source of the existence of the universe and its rationality as reflected in the laws of nature which science explores. And this is a quote from Bob Russell. In this sense, for Bill, God is the primary cause of the universe and the creator of its secondary causes of nature, such as the fundamental forces and particles which science discovers. Taken into the area of evolutionary biology, God is the cause of the existence of the entire natural history of life on Earth and perhaps elsewhere in the universe, um, and the one who gives to nature the causal capacity for the biological evolution of life through such processes as variation and natural selection. So, again, Bob putting it in a nutshell. The Roman Catholic molecular biologist Martinez Hewlett worked with Bill Steger for many years uh, with the St. Albert the Great Forum on theology and science at the University of Arizona. And just to say a little bit about that, uh, St. Albert the Great Forum, it was actually started um, uh, not by Bill, but by a um, PhD student, Joe Heller, in the astronomy department, um, and by a, a then you know, young chaplain, Dominican chaplain at the Newman Center. And Joe was realizing that he was getting challenged in his faith by his you know, fellow grad students and scientists and wanted an opportunity to reflect. So he got together with Michael Sherwin, who is the Dominican, and together, again, you gathered people around, including Bill and, and other uh, members of the faculty at the university who were you know, Christians, uh, they weren't all Catholics, uh, Christians and, uh, and in, involved in science. And that was the uh, St. Albert the Great Forum, which ran from uh, 1991, it started, until basically until Bill left Tucson, so uh, last year in, in the early spring. Uh, a, a good run. It's now getting, as it were, reconstituted, because initially it started as a forum in which students like um, Joe Haller could reflect on their faith and then the students kind of left and became a kind of, shall we say, a grey-haired senior discussion group on science and religion, which was wonderful but not quite its original purpose. And uh, those who are left on the board are trying to go back a bit to its purpose of engaging students and we you know, kind of find various ways to do that and through existing structures there at the Newman Center for, for discussion, like Theology on Tap is one idea. So, anyway, just a, an aside on that, but an enormously successful thing. And certainly in the latter years, the only reason why it, it stayed in existence was the energy that Bill put into that, into that group. Um, so, anyway, Marty Hewlett, who is one of the, kind of the founder, um, you know, faculty members of the group, um, says, Father Bill was both a spiritual and professional mentor to me. He was instrumental in my move from, from science to the field of philosophy of science and science and religion. I will miss him as a friend and advisor. And I know Marty well and I know that, that he's very sincere in those remarks. Um, Bill Steger, um, this is continuing with Peter Hesse's account, Bill Steger was both a brilliant and careful astronomer 
and an astute partner in dialogue about issues at the interface between religion and science. It was his lifelong conviction that God is speaking to us, and these are Bill's words, God is speaking to us not only through scripture, but also through the beauties, the wonder, the intricacies, and the harmonies of creation. And so what we discover, either about the way our brain works and how it coordinates our behavior, or what we discover about the biology of the cell, or the chemistry of DNA, or the working of cosmology, or physics, all those things are going to tell us at least a little bit about how God acts in the world. And Peter concludes, Father Bill, we bid you fond farewell and Godspeed in remembrance of and thanksgiving for your contributions to our understanding of so many facets of life in the universe. There you go. Thank you. We asked George Coyne, the former director of the Vatican Observatory, to send us a few words. He couldn't be with us, but uh, uh, Ellen uh, Ryan is now going to read what he told us. Before I read George Coyne's message, I'll just take the opportunity of having a microphone to comment that um, I, I have this very vivid memory of having a faith discussion uh, with Bill in at Fairfield University in one of those Clavius townhouses and one a living room absolutely packed when Bill talked to us about the bill the big the bill bang theory and uh, and and my own excitement about learning about this in a in a way that seemed uh, novel and that seemed possible to link theology with and what I remember most is Jackie Conlon's absolute excitement about about that conversation and how she would just capture him at every social hour after that for years. <laughs> Remember, Bill, when <laughs> you introduced me to the Big Bang Theory. And also I have a friend, a former chair of religious studies, who invited Bill as, to a faith and science discussion at McMaster University uh, 15 years ago. And whenever he sees me, he starts to talk about how impressed he was when Bill came to our university in Canada. George Coyne is the former director of the Vatican Observatory uh, for most of Bill's time there in Tucson. And this is his statement. One of Bill's finest characteristics was his availability to do whatever was necessary to contribute to the progress of whatever group he was working with. And I think we've heard uh, about a number of those groups already. A little known episode which illustrates this is the following. Bill joined the staff of the Vatican Observatory in 1979. I was the new director, having been appointed by John Paul I in September 1978, and I was trying to build up a research institute in Tucson, Arizona. I asked Bill if he would reside in Tucson and become an observational astronomer. Can you imagine a more stupid request to one who was fresh from years of theoretical research on such topic, topics as torsion and bimetric theories of gravity, harmonic mopping, mapping in gravitational theories, general relativity and gravity, etc. Bill immediately sensed the needs that a small staff, we were five at that time, with one observational astronomer, faced for its future. With the telescopes on Mount Lemmon near Tucson, he immediately took up a long series of observations of five color photometry of stellar clusters. He collected the data on paper tapes and then spent long hours processing the data through tape readers linked to computers at the University of Arizona. As you can imagine, Bill was thoroughly dedicated to the task for the good of the observatory. As we built up our staff of observers, Bill happily and passionately returned to his theoretical pursuits. I've often wondered whether we would have succeeded in developing the Research Institute in Tucson had Bill not selflessly dedicated himself to its beginning. Thank you, Bill, and pray for us as we do for you. Thank you.